If you like Velocity, this is the episode for you. Josh and I are going to talk about our own experiences with training Velocity. I'll talk about it from a player and a coach's perspective on some of the things that have helped me along the way. We'll also talk about some nutrition with gaining weight as well as weightlifting as those can be key elements to gaining Velocity. But before we jump into the episode, we need a huge favor of you. We are trying to grow this podcast to be as big and as popular as possible and to help as many coaches, players, and parents as we can. In order to do that, we need you to help us get the word out. And the simplest way you can do this is to hit the subscribe button on YouTube, as well as following us and downloading the episodes on Apple and Spotify. That will allow us to reach more people and accomplish our goal of helping players, coaches, and parents. Without further ado, let's jump into the episode. All right, Josh, I want to take you on a little journey today with a little story to paint a clear picture of what we want to talk about today. So I'm going to describe a Division One pitcher that, by all accounts, absolutely dominated. He had a .5 or a .6 ERA through his first 50 innings, finished the year with a 1.6 through 100 innings, um, was a left-handed pitcher, did, did all the little things, didn't walk guys, was phenomenal. Now, would you believe me if I told you this very pitcher did not get drafted? I wouldn't. What would be a reason you think that he didn't get drafted? Um, either velocity or projectability. Yep, those are two good guesses, right? But even at the Division One level, right, you would think a left-handed pitcher, Division One baseball, statistically he's good. You would think that guy would get an opportunity. But the fact is that stats, how well you pitch, only plays a very small percentage of what goes into getting drafted. So that pitcher was me back in 2014. So we're talking 10 years ago where even then velocity was still super, super important. Now, 2014 wasn't that long ago. But when you think about it being 10 years ago and where we're at now with velocity training, We've come a long ways with the way we develop it, the way we train it, and how important it is. And even back then in 2014, a left-handed pitcher throwing 83 to 85, I would on a good day be 86, maybe 87, but really lived in the low to mid 80s. And that was the number one reason I did not get drafted. So today, I want to make sure that there isn't another pitcher out there that doesn't understand the business of it and how it works when it comes to getting drafted, because you can put up all the numbers you want. And I want you to pitch. Well, I want every single pitcher to dominate from a statistical standpoint, but if you want to play professional baseball, the reality is you have to get to a certain baseline from a velocity standpoint, your stuff has to get to a certain level. And at the end of the day, that's what matters the most because from a projectability standpoint, like you just said, they can project more accurately what that guy will do at the next level. So I didn't get drafted. I did play independent ball for four years. And truth be told, once I got even to that level, it was pretty evident that velocity was more important. I started to get hit around more. I was never a strikeout guy. But even at that point, I started missing less bats, more contact, more harder contact. The margin for error was so small that if I made a mistake over the middle, I was going to pay for it. Now, even if you throw a little bit harder, you might pay for it. But as I showed... um, on wednesday so today we're recording a week before this is actually released but today i posted something about velocity i don't know if you saw it josh but i'll share it on the screen this is division one baseball this year this heat map here so for those of you that are not watching on youtube i am showing a heat map of all 95 plus miles an hour pitches right down the middle in 2024 in division one baseball the weighted on base average or woba was 259 So for those of you that aren't familiar with WOBA or weighted on-base average, it's on the same scale as on-base percentage. So if you know what a good on-base percentage is, you know what a good WOBA is. So 259, that would be a horrendous on-base percentage for a hitter, which means that is very good for the hitter. Or sorry, very good for the pitcher. 95 plus miles an hour, literally right down the middle, the WOBA in Division I baseball is 259. Now this other graph, you're right, not graph, but this other heat map, is showing all fastballs this year that are around the perimeter of the strike zone. So every location, but right down the middle, but still inside the strike zone. I have it broken down by velocity. 
So pitches that are 87 to 90 miles an hour around the perimeter of the strike zone have a WOBA of 327, so a lot higher than 259. 91 to 94 gets better, down to 291, but it's still not better than literally 95 plus right down the middle. And now when we get to 95 plus, and now you're going to the edges with 95 plus, now the WOBA is 224. So it is a consistent progression and drop off the lower your VLO and the performance from a weighted on base average standpoint. Now I could even break this down for those of you that like more traditional stats. If you like batting average, I don't have them right in front of me, but I did look at this when I was researching this. It's the exact same progression with batting average. So the point of this is velocity matters. Is it all that matters? No, of course not. But for a lot of players, this is the missing link for them. This is what is holding them back from getting opportunities. So today we want to help you with that. We want to help you with ideas of how you can train it. What is a smart way to do it? We'll talk about our own experiences of how we have trained it and had success stories, maybe some things to watch out for, and hopefully leave you in a better place than where you started. So Josh, you've shared on this podcast a couple of times now that you went from throwing 78 miles an hour at 16 to 95 at 18. That is an incredible progression. I think probably 99.9% .9 of guys that are 16 throwing 78 are never going to throw 95. That doesn't mean that more of them can't though. So I want you to share with us some of the things that you did. Like I know you've shared, you went to driveline, you were using weighted balls, but like what are some of the things that you think made the biggest difference in you gaining velocity? Yeah, for sure. We can definitely dive into that. But I'm actually really curious as to how did you dominate the D1 level throwing uh, low 80s? I actually didn't know that about you. Was it just mixing pitches or? Yeah, I, I didn't walk anybody. I mean, that was that was the real key. So I think I had like a 4% walk rate. So big league average is 8% or 8.5%. So I didn't walk anybody. And I was just very good at changing speeds, locating. Like when I didn't just throw strikes, like I actually for the most part, threw the ball where I wanted to throw it. My big inspiration was Jamie Moyer. So for those of you that know who Jamie Moyer is, he was a soft throwing left-handed pitcher, played in the major leagues for 20 plus years, and he was the definition of a crafty lefty. And I studied everything about him. I read his books. I, I just, I studied everything about him. And one of the things that he talked about was use your slowness to your advantage. So what he meant by that was when hitters see soft throwers, especially soft lefties, they get really antsy, especially at the college level, because they they see it like, oh, this guy's throwing slow. I'm going to crush this guy. So they get extra excited. They try to do more at the plate. So I use that to my advantage by changing speeds, throwing a lot of changeups early, and then showing a fastball in late so I could use that 83 and make it play like it was you know at least 88 plus. So it really came down to the sequencing, the mental game. I was huge on the mental game. Like Even though I threw 83, I acted like I threw 95. And I think that projected itself onto um, my demeanor, the way I attacked hitters, my confidence and my aggressiveness with executing pitches. Uh, but the year before, so truth be told, my junior year, I had a horrible year. I had a 6.2 ERA my junior year in 83 innings. So I was a weekend starter, didn't pitch well, just got, it was, it was really like every other outing. One outing would be good. The next outing I'd get killed. Good outing, get killed. And I was trying to be someone I wasn't at the time I was pitching as if I did throw 95. What I mean by that was I threw too many fastballs. Like I, I should have been throwing more off speed pitches. I should have been pitching to my strengths more. And that off season tried to gain more velocity. Didn't really know what I was doing. Didn't have a lot of success. And honestly, I don't know why, but I actually threw harder when I was in junior college. So my freshman and sophomore year, my sophomore year specifically, I was 85 to 88. And then my junior year, I was like 84, 86. And then my senior year, I was like 83 to 86. I, I don't know why the velo went down, but I became a better pitcher because I had to be or else I wasn't going to, you know, I wasn't going to be able to last long in the game if I didn't learn how to pitch. So I did all those other things really, really well, which works in college, I think. But at the next level, it's just so hard to dominate with below average velocity. Like guys do it and people always want to look at the outliers. But most of you guys aren't outliers. I wasn't an outlier. There was a threshold when I got to independent ball that I kind of reached my threshold. I was, I pitched well. I was an okay pitcher, but I didn't pitch good enough to prove that, okay, this guy actually is the same guy that he was in college. So I'd never got signed by an org because I never proved that mid eighties worked even in independent ball. Um, now I did throw harder and I'll get into that later in this episode as 
time went on independent ball and I started to learn more about training velocity. Uh, but the fact of the matter is most of you guys are not outliers and we can look at the outliers. We can look at the Tom Glavins. We can look at the Jamie Moyers and we can strive to do that. We can strive to be command guys, change speeds. But the truth of the matter is you're probably not going to be Jamie Moore. You're probably not going to be Tom Glavin. So we need to make sure we are doing everything we can to reach your full potential from a velocity standpoint, while also still working on that command stuff. We want to give you the biggest margin for error that we can and the most opportunities. And for most of you, it's going to be the velocity training. Yeah, that's so interesting. So you were able to change all those speeds and command the ball, but you still weren't an outlier. That's super interesting to me because when people think of outlier pitches and soft tosses, they just think, oh, if I can hit my spots and change speeds, then I'll have success. But you're saying that that's not the case, right? Yeah, I mean, I think to a degree, right? I mean, I think the what, kind of what I'm getting at was, number one, pitchers aren't as good at hitting their spots as they think they are, um, especially when I feel like when I got to independent ball and I got to the next level, I, I was a reliever, number one, so I got in a different role for the most part. I started a little bit, but was mostly a relief pitcher. College, I was a starter, and I just never really got in the groove as a relief pitcher. They tried to use me as a left-handed specialist a lot um, in those types of roles. I just did not thrive in that. I actually was the opposite of most lefties. I actually did better against righties than I did left-handers. Um, I think it was because of the changeup. I just threw a lot of changeups. Um, so, and I just never got comfortable. I, I didn't have the same confidence, didn't have the same um, – I don't, I still don't think I was the same pitcher as I was in college. Like college, it was like there wasn't pressure of losing my starting job. And that gave me confidence to try things, to work on things versus an independent ball. I was fighting for my life almost every outing. I, if I had a bad outing, I thought I might get released because that's just the the nature of the business in indie ball. So I think that played a big factor of it. And it kind of caused me to not execute as well as I used to, just because I think I lacked a little bit of that confidence because of you know, just where I was in my career and just not no longer being the, you know, one of the better players on the field. And so when you were in college, was the mentality that, oh, I don't need velocity because I'm dominating or why didn't you try to increase that velocity during college? Oh, I tried. I promise you, I tried to throw harder. Um, I tried to throw harder since I was in high school. I mean, I don't know. I was, it was weird. I was one of those guys, like I could long toss forever. Like I could throw the ball from end zone to end zone on a football field, like even in high school and I get on the mound and it was 80 in high school, senior year, you know, it's just, it didn't make sense. And it's just, I think it came down to, I, and I think I talked about this before. I just became more robotic. Didn't, didn't have the same athleticism. Um, I wasn't in the weight room also, like I was in the weight room, but I wasn't really doing what I needed to do. Like I was undersized. I was 145 pounds my senior year of high school college i think by my senior year i was 170 i mean i'm 511 so i mean it's not super skinny for 511 it's about average but i still was on the thinner side so all of those factors i mean I, I think i just was uneducated i didn't know exactly what i needed to do to throw harder like i remember one bullpen in the fall of my senior year my pitching coach was literally having me try every possible thing mechanically <laughs> to like try to throw harder and they'd be like 82 82 82. <laughs> I'm, like, I, I'm like, I'm telling you, I'm trying to throw it hard. I don't, I don't know what to tell you. Um, and so it wasn't until later on, I found out about like actually following a good weighted ball program and all those things that, that started to help later down the road. Um, but no, I definitely was trying to throw harder. It just, for some reason, I, I don't know, I, it, reflecting back on it now, maybe it's just once I got in game mode, I tried just to slow down and place the ball because that's what was comfortable and I knew I could execute my spots. I, I don't really know why my velo even went down from you know my sophomore year of college to my senior year of college, um, but my senior year was my best year of my career from a stat standpoint. So it, it was tough to to want to change things from that standpoint. Mm, yeah, I think velocity is just such a tricky thing where – you can train for it and you can do all the right things, but sometimes you're just not going to see the increase in velocity. And that's something that I'm struggling with right now is that I'm doing everything to try to get my velo back up to where it was in 2021, where I was throwing in the high 90s. And that's the hardest I'd ever thrown in my life. But now I just can't seem to get there. And... <clears throat> Yeah, it just goes to show that velocity is a very tricky thing. And 
it also comes in spikes. So it's not a linear progression. It's you got to keep putting in the work. You got to keep coming in, do your mobility, lifting, throwing. And then maybe you'll get like a two to three mile an hour unlock and you'll just spike a little bit. And then you're going to plateau or maybe even lose a little bit of velocity before the next spike. So I think for the people who are listening, don't get discouraged if you've been training for a couple months and you haven't been seeing any results, as long as you know that you're doing the right things. Yeah, that's a good point. And for you, I mean, you're already a mid nineties thrower. So like you going from, let's just say your starting point is 78, you going from 78 to 85 was probably a lot easier than going from 95 to 98, right? Like once you get higher, it becomes so hard to get that next level or that next step because you're already doing so many things well to throw 95 that now every single detail matters so much from a mechanical standpoint, a physical preparedness standpoint, your rest, how fatigued you are. It's just the the minor, most minor things matter the harder you throw. So I, I would, I do want to encourage guys that there is a lot of hope. If you are throwing 80 miles an hour, if you're in the seventies, like there is a big jump that you have the potential to make. You just have to know the right things to do. And hopefully we can share some insights on that. But um, I would be curious for you. So, you know, you were in the high nineties, you said 2021. Yes. Okay. So you've had back surgery since then. Do you think that's playing a big factor in that? Yeah, definitely. I had back surgery and I herniated a disc. And so I'm no longer able to lift heavy. And that was part of what actually got me to throw so much harder was that I was able to lift really heavy. I was squatting over four plates. I was deadlifting 600 pounds plus. And so I feel like all of that strength led to that spike in velocity. And now that I'm not able to do that, certain muscles have atrophied and I'm not able to produce that force that I could in 2021. And so I need to find ways to work around that. And <clears throat> so far it's been a challenge, but I'm still here and I'm still putting in the work and finding ways to try to get that below back. What are some of the exercises that you're doing now that you think are helping and are making a difference? Yeah. So in 2021, I just hammered the compound movements, just the fundamentals, back squats, deadlifts, a lot of bilateral stuff. Now that I can't put a barbell on my back anymore or lift something really heavy off the floor, I'm doing more single leg stuff. So my favorite exercise is actually a goblet pistol squat. So I'm holding a, a dumbbell right here in a front squat position. And then I get up on a box and then I do a pistol squat off it. And that's one of the exercises that I can really try to load up. I can do over like one, 120 pounds on that. And that's like as heavy as, you know, like three, 400 pounds on, on squat. So I really like that exercise. I'm doing a lot of single arm exercises as well. So dumbbell bench, single arm, um, dumbbell rows, single arm. And the purpose of all of that is to train up my core because why I got back surgery was because of my core was weak and it wasn't supporting my body. And so my lower back was taking all of the weight. And so now I'm just trying to train up my core so that that takes more of the weight instead of my lower back and all the stress goes there. That's great. Yeah. So you're, you know, I feel like this is kind of the progression you would have made anyway, because you were getting so strong with the bilateral exercises like squat and deadlift that usually the progression is we're moving for speed and we're also doing more single leg type of work or split stance variations. So while you can't do the heavy bilateral work, it sounds like you're finding really good workarounds like single leg pistol squats for heavy weight to where it's not stressing the back as much, but you're still able to get a lot of really good work in on the lower half. When you were 16, what was like a big part of your lifting program? Like, were you mainly focusing on like the big three of, of deadlifting, squatting and benching? Or like, what was your main focus in the weight room when you were 16? Yeah, for sure. When I was 16, I did swap around programs a lot. But looking back, all I really did was hammer the fundamental exercises of um, squat, deadlift, bench, 
and some type of row or pull up. And I remember doing the five by five program. Do you know what the five by five program is? I do. Yeah. Five, five sets of five reps for most of the major compound lifts, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's pretty much just squat five by five, bench five by five, deadlift five by five. And I'll do a couple accessories around that. And that's pretty much all I did. And that got me stronger. I feel like for building a good base, all you really need is progressive overload and any kind of program that will allow you to do that will provide a lot of results, especially in the weight room. Yeah. I think that is the number one thing that teenagers should do to start out with. Like you don't need to get cute in the weight room. Like you don't need to do quote unquote baseball specific exercises. You just need to get strong, right? And do it at the the primary lifts of squatting, deadlifting bench. If you don't want to do a barbell bench, do dumbbells. You can do pull-ups as well for another pulling exercise, but like you really don't need to get fancy, get as strong as you can and gradually progress the weight every week for as long as you can. And you're eventually going to reach a plateau and you'll be able to break through that eventually as well. But like, if you can just hammer those lifts early on in your career, you're going to get so much stronger and you're going to set the foundation as well for when you get to college and you are starting to do more specific exercises, you will have already accomplished, you know, some of your basic strength foundations, but you've also have learned how to hinge properly, how to squat, all of those fundamental movements that you're going to need to do at the next level in the weight room, as well as things that apply to throwing, like your ability to hinge, squat, push, pull, rotate, all those things apply to pitching. And if you can set that foundation early, you're only setting yourself up for success and you're going to get some really easy velocity gains purely by doing that. Yeah, you couldn't have said it better. I think just hammering those compound um, exercises are going to provide so, so much results. And just from a muscle gain and weight gain perspective, those are the biggest bang for your buck because if you're hammering squats, Looking back, I probably would have done front squats instead of back squats just because it's less pressure on the spine. But if you're doing, you know, this heavy squats, heavy deadlifts, heavy pressing and pulling movements, like newbie gains are overpowered. Like you're going to gain strength, muscle, weight like crazy. And so another big component of how I gained that velocity was that I gained like 30 to 40 pounds in one year. And a big part of that was the lifting program, but also the um, eating and the diet at home played a massive role. Yeah. Walk through that briefly, just because I know I hear a lot of kids say they're trying to gain weight, they're eating all the time and they're not gaining weight. So you get used to said you gained 30 to 40 pounds, which that is some serious weight. What were some of the keys for you? Yeah, I think for gaining weight, it's just, pure math. Um, you have to find out how much you're burning. Somehow you can, you know, use any of the tech whoop or um, Apple watch, you know, all the tech available these days, you can get a general idea of how much you're burning on a day to day ba basis. And you just have to eat more than that. And for a hard gainer, it's painful. Trust me, I know it, it sucks so much. When I was going through that phase, the amount of peanut butter sandwiches I ate was was crazy. But yeah, my diet pretty much looked like I would wake up and I would have like a high calorie shake where I would cram everything in, like as many eggs as I could, you know, protein shake, uh, protein powder, all of that. And I would have that in the morning for a snack. I'd have a peanut butter sandwich for lunch. I'd have some type of meat with rice and then I'd have another snack, peanut butter sandwich, sneak that in and then. At night, I would have a big dinner. I'd tell my mom, hey, I'm trying to gain weight. Can you make a big dinner for me? And so she would cook that up. Thanks, mom. And I would smash that. And so, yeah, it sucks. Honestly, that was harder than the training itself. Eating was harder than my throwing. It was harder than mobility or lifting. But it was probably one of the biggest components of me gaining velocity. Yeah, no, it really isn't because I was the same way, right? I, I just said I was 140 pounds, 145 pounds my senior year, and I thought I was eating a ton. Obviously, I wasn't eating enough because like you said, for most people, most situations, it is simple math, right? You have to eat more than you are burning. And a simple way to think about this is 
If you want to gain one pound a week, you have to eat 500 calories more than you are burning per day. So if you do that for seven days, that is 3,500 calories in excess of what you're burning. 3,500 calories equals one pound. If you want to gain two pounds a week, you got to eat a thousand calories more than what you're burning every single day. So now we're getting into some serious calorie numbers, especially if you're a guy that's burning, you know, 4,000 plus a day, which is likely for a lot of teenagers with how active you are and just how fast your metabolism is. There is a calculator, I'll put this in the show notes, that Precision Nutrition has. It's a free macro calculator. Basically, just plug in your age, your height, weight, your activity level, and it will spit out for you roughly how many calories a day you are burning. So if you don't have a Whoop or you don't have an Aura Ring or you don't have something that tracks it for you, this will give you a general average of what you're burning. And it also will give you some recipes and some meals and how many how many calories and specific macros you need for each meal to reach your goal. So it's pretty cool. It's pretty insightful. It's it's very helpful. I use it a lot with, with guys that I work with. And even if it's not perfectly accurate, which it's not going to be perfectly accurate, but it does give you a starting point. And if you're eating the amount that it says on there for, let's just say, one to two weeks and you're not gaining any weight, then you need to up it by 500 calories. So do that for every single week or two weeks. If you're not gaining any weight, then you need to eat 500 calories more a day from that and just keep adjusting it until you get to the range where you're going at a one to two pound rate per week. Yeah, for sure. And I think especially for the hard gainers, if you're doing everything right, you're doing throwing, lifting, mobility, and you feel like you're doing everything, but you're not gaining uh, gaining velocity, it might be your weight that's holding you back. And that was definitely the case for me. Um, I was doing all these throwing programs, lifting programs, but as soon as I started eating a lot as a 16, 17 year old, and at that time my testosterone was high, you know, I was going through puberty and everything. So I grew and got thick. And so that might be something to really look into if you're, you're, if you're plateauing and you think you're doing everything right. Yeah, for sure. So let's dive into weighted balls, specific velocity training. I guess not weighted balls necessarily, but let's talk about velocity training specifically. At what age do you think it's appropriate to do a specific velocity program? And I guess when I'm saying velocity program, I am referring to weighted balls, plyo balls, things of those nature. When do you think is an appropriate age in your experience? And, and like, when should guys really start to focus on that? Yeah, so I think plyo balls, you can do them pretty young. Um, I would say as soon as you're pretty developed, 13, 14 years old, you can uh, incorporate plyo balls into your routine. I wouldn't say plyo velos just yet and definitely not pull downs just yet, but I th think you can definitely incorporate it um, and incorporate some plyo drills, you know, roll-ins, pivot picks, and also just long toss. I think long toss is huge at that age. It's it really opens up your arm. It increases the external rotation of your arm. I attribute a lot of my velo from long toss because I did that all the time. And I have really great external rotation. And I think that's partly why um, I have that. But I do think getting into the specific plyo velo routines, the pull down routines, I would wait until I was about 16 because that is very high stress on your arm. What do you think? Yeah, no, I agree. I think you nailed it with the long toss. Like, I think that is your quote unquote velocity program when you are um, 13, you know, 13, 14, 15 in that age range, like really even up through 18, like long toss can play a huge factor in helping you gain velocity, promotes athleticism, it frees guys up. I think it's just overall just a really good idea for a lot of players. And then from the plyo standpoint, like, yeah, I think, I think as long as you're not approaching it at a young age with the idea of I am trying to throw these as hard as I can with the goal of it being to throw harder, I think it's okay as long as that's not the case. I think if you approach it from the standpoint of I'm starting to create good habits from a routine standpoint, a good warm up routine, I'm using these maybe just to just to work on some mechanical things. Not that I think you should get too cute with mechanics at a young age, but I think as long as you're like treating it more as like a foundation of, of building a plan and a routine for yourself, I think that's all good and well. I just would definitely hold off on using it as a quote unquote velocity tool at too young of an age. And 
you know, once you get to 16, I mean, and even 16, I mean, there's plenty of guys that do it. I work with guys that are 16. I have them use plyo balls, but I, I am always aware of the individual and what is the lowest hanging fruit for them. What is the most important thing? Like I have 16 year olds that I don't do actual, you know, weighted ball pull downs with. I don't do actual plyo velo with I'm using the plyo balls more as a mechanical tool, a warm up tool, those types of things. And they're gaining velocity more so through that part of it, even and the the weight room, like we talked about, getting stronger, gaining weight, all of those things. So I do think that it's important to understand what is the low hanging fruit for you with the velocity. If you're completely filled out, you're strong, you're doing everything right, and you know you're healthy and all that, and you're just not throwing as hard as you need to to get to the next level, then yeah, you probably need to get a little bit more aggressive with your training, especially if you're getting closer to college and you want to play out of college or a high level college. So it does come back to knowing your own situation, knowing where you're at and what is the most important thing for you to make that next step. Um, but for, you know, for you, I would love to hear about this. It sounds like you were doing all of this simultaneously, which is probably what led to such a huge burst in velocity. Now, I know you went from 78 to 95, you know, in that two year time frame. but can you walk through even just like the first two months of, you know, if you were you at driveline at 16? No, I got there when I was 17 turning 18. Okay, so 16, were you doing pull downs and plyo velo at 16? Uh, yeah, I was. Okay, I, so, so actually, tell me about that. Actually, I, when I first started my velocity training journey, I did a program called Top Velocity. Do you know what that is? Yeah. Yeah, so um, they are anti weighted balls. And they are big med ball guys. So for the first, I would say three to four months, I did their program where I would throw two pound med balls in all kinds of positions and I would radar them. And that was pretty much my weighted ball velocity program at that time. And, but I was lifting really heavy. I was eating. And I think that's what um, increased my velocity more than the med balls. But as soon as I started to figure out what driveline baseball was, I bought the weighted balls and I started the velocity training program straight away, which included a plyo velo at the start of the week and then pull downs at the end of the week. Okay, got it. And so when you were at top velocity, how much harder did you throw? You went from 78 to what? I'm not too sure about the specific numbers, but I know I gained at least like five miles an hour just because of probably from the lifting and just from like a good program um, perspective where I was actually following a structured program instead of just, all right, I'm going out and playing twice a week and I'm not even training properly. Yeah, exactly. Right. When you're at that age, like just having any sort of program, you're probably going to get better just because you have structure and you have something that you're following and you're getting a new stimulus that you, that you haven't had before. So you're going to get gains. So let's um, let's talk about some s specifics of some of these velocity programs. We touched a little bit. You just mentioned plyo velo. You mentioned pull downs. What are some other aspects of, of velocity training that you've done? Um, you know, for me, like something that comes to mind is like mound velo doing, you know, weighted ball velo on the mound or just regular baseball at max effort. Like what are, what are all of the options that you've done or that you have seen when it comes to the specifics of velocity training? You know, I think you touched on it briefly, but I think a big one was that I didn't focus on mechanics until I was 18 and I didn't even pitch until I was 16. So I was a shortstop all up until I was 16. And so I had all that athleticism in my body and I wasn't thinking about trying to get cute with the mechanics and nothing like that. I was just focused on, all right, I'm just trying to throw this ball as hard as I can. And with the drills that came with the driveline program and the pull downs that I was doing, my mechanics kind of just morphed into a high velocity delivery. And I do think that I was lucky, but I do think there's something in not focusing on mechanics too young because i see that all the time there are guys who are throwing you know 70 or 80 miles an hour and they they think that their back leg rotation is going to be the unlock to throw 90 you know um 
And so I think the biggest thing for me was pull downs because it promoted so much athleticism and it taught me the intent to throw hard. And that was the biggest thing when I was at driveline was that you need to throw hard to throw hard and pull downs taught me the intent and what was actually required to throw at a high velocity while also training the athleticism because you're sprinting at the target and you got to turn and throw and stop all your momentum and try to create as much velocity as you can. And that's a pretty complex task. So doing that, train my body and morph my mechanics into um, what it was into a high, de high velocity delivery. Yeah, I totally agree with that from the mechanical standpoint that, you know, that was me. I was trying to focus on my mechanics too much when I was on the mound. When I was long tossing, I wasn't. And that's where the disconnect was. And the intent part of it, that's what I learned later on in independent ball. As I started to learn about driveline, I learned about all these other companies, mainly driveline at that time. Um, but learning what it meant to actually try to throw hard. I had never actually tried to throw at max effort. And the second I did that, I went up a couple miles an hour purely by just trying to throw harder. So I found out about driveline back in 2016. I want to say it was, I was a high school baseball coach at the time. I was, I had played two years of independent ball. I had just been released the previous summer, like halfway through the summer. Didn't really know what I was going to do. I was throwing 84, 86 at the time. And I was looking for something truthfully for my players at the time that I was, I was looking for something to help them to throw harder. Stumbled across driveline, saw they had an eight week free program. It was with weighted balls, had the whole set. I was like, you know what? I'm going to put myself through this first. I'm not going to just have my players that are, you know, 15, just do this random program that I am, I know nothing about. So I decided to do it. It was an eight week free program. It consisted of, of pull downs. At this point, it was literally just pull downs. There was no plyo. Eh, there might've been a plyo velo. It wasn't on the mound though. Uh, but it was like purely pull downs for the most part. And by the end of it, I, my max pull down was 97, which for me was, was really good first day on the mound. Um, so they didn't want you thrown on the mound like at all. I don't think during this eight weeks, so I wasn't on the mound at all. And then I got on the mound for my first bullpen and I hit 89. I had never hit 89 in my life. And so now I'm like, Oh, okay. This, this stuff actually works. This was literally in an eight week time period. I went from, you know, my lifetime high of 87 to being 89. So I was like, okay, I'm, I need to do some more research on this. I need to dive into this. I ended up going to, uh, it wasn't a conference, but, but Kyle Bodie and his, uh, partner were in Arizona for something. And I went to it. I met them. I threw in front of them and like, I was started to get all in on what they were teaching and, and try to learn more about it. And the intent was one of the biggest things for me. That's what those pull downs did. Like you said, like you, you have to be aggressive with it. You're, you know, the traditional run and guns, you're going at a full sprint and you are moving as fast as you can. And it's teaching you to move fast. And now, Sometimes there's a disconnect with guys on the mound. Like you still have to learn how to do that out of the delivery, which is another aspect of it. But that initial cue or that initial um, thought of trying to actually throw hard can be a big unlock for guys, um, especially back then, like five, six, seven years ago. It was especially helpful then for older players because they had never done that. Now I feel like because of, you know, driveline, how much they're around tread and some of these other companies, like I would say, more kids are trying to throw harder now. So they have the intent piece. Now it's just a matter of timing up that intent correctly and still being loose and not tensing up when they're doing it. There's all these little, little aspects of it that can help you still throw, throw even harder um, with what feels like lower effort than going at max effort with it from an intent standpoint. Yeah, for sure. <clears throat> and you said that you never, you didn't touch the mound for eight weeks. That's exactly what I did, but I did that for months on end. I literally did plyo velos on flat ground and I did pull downs on the flat ground and I didn't touch the mound until I kind of knew that I had the capability of touching high 80s to 90 and I just thought of it as okay the pull downs and plyo velos were building the foundation and building the power and the elasticity needed to throw hard and then now when I get on the mound, I can try to transfer that. But I'm not going to be trying to build velo on the mound. I'm going to build the velo off the mound on flat ground and then go transfer it. 
Yeah, I like that. It just it keeps you disconnected from thinking about pitching and it allows you just to stay free and athletic as long as you can. And then eventually when you get to the mound, you can translate that because you have just done it so much. I, I like that idea. Um, I think that's really helpful for a lot of guys, especially that are younger and in the situation that you were in. So we've talked about a lot of general things that we've done. Um, I think it'd be helpful to dive into some specifics as well as, you know, maybe like what are some of those velocity numbers that you do need to see before you start moving on to other aspects of your training. So let's say you're 16, you're a sophomore in high school and you want to play division one baseball from your experience. What do you think is like, what does the goal velocity need to be and where do you need to get to before you even think about worrying about the other aspects of pitching? Yeah, it really depend on what your goals are, but if it's to go to a powerhouse university or get drafted these days, I mean, I hear that 95 is the new 90. I don't know if you've heard that, Jared, but, you know, it's it's the brutal truth. And I think if you want to get to that level, you need to be throwing at least 92, 93 miles an hour. Now, if your goal is to just go play college baseball, I think 88, 90 is plenty, even lower than that um, if you're a good pitcher. But if you really want to maximize your career, I think the way the game's going, 93, I would say, is a good benchmark. Yeah, I would agree for the most part with that. Like, I think, you know, let's just say you want to play Division One baseball, 88 to 90, I think is a good number. Once you get to 88 to 90, it's not that that is like the ultimate goal from a velocity standpoint, but you're at the point to where if I'm throwing 88 to 90 and I have general feel for an off-speed pitch, I'm around the strike zone. I'm probably going to get an opportunity. If you're 88 to 90 and you have no clue where the ball is going and you don't have a secondary pitch, rather than focusing more on velocity, that's when you probably do need to shift your training to making sure that you're around the strike zone because the velocity isn't the part that's holding you back from getting an opportunity. It's the strike throwing ability. So that's where like you have to understand what that trade-off is, especially if you're a high school kid. If you're trying to get to college baseball, you want to play at a high level, you get to 88 to 90, your v velo is good enough to get an opportunity. Now you need to focus on those other areas. And as those areas develop and you go to your college, now you're a freshman, you can still work on velocity and hopefully you're going to throw harder by the time you're 18 until you're 21, 22. So it's not that velocity isn't important anymore. You're still going to work on and develop it in other areas by getting stronger and all those things. But you have to understand at what point is that no longer the low hanging fruit to get you your opportunity. And then, like you said, if now you're in college and you want to get to pro ball, okay, there is another threshold that you need to get to, to get a good opportunity. There are guys that get drafted at 90, but once again, there's few and far between with some of these things we're talking about and you want to give yourself the best chance possible, but it's always that give and take of command training, velocity training, developing off speed pitches. You have to understand like what needs to get pulled up for you to get your next opportunity. Yeah, for sure. And I had a personal experience with this where I went on a recruiting trip while I was throwing 88 to 90 and I didn't have great command. I've never really had great command. I have a really good slider, but when I was 88 to 90, I got a bunch of Juco offers, but no, I don't think I even got a single D1 offer. Now, a couple months later, I kept training, training, and I go on a similar trip, a similar recruiting trip. It was out in Arizona the Arizona Fall Classic. And this time I'm throwing 93, 94. And I get more D1 offers than I know. I didn't know what to do with. So, and I also got an offer from my dream school, which was Stanford at the time. So even that three to four miles an hour makes a huge difference. And I think if you can, you should try to strive for that. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, it's it's crazy how much of a difference a couple miles an hour can make, but it really does. And like even when we look at the breakdown that I shared earlier from a performance standpoint, like every mile an hour can make a big difference. And it's also, you know, this gets talked about as well, but it's worth saying again that as your velocity goes up, it allows your secondary pitches to play even better because now they're sharper, they're harder most likely, and they're going to be more effective. So it's funny, we're in a a day and age where we're training to throw as hard as possible, but we're also throwing as few of 
few of fastballs as possible at the same time. And then when you do throw a fastball, it plays up even more. So it's just a really tough time to be a hitter to say the least. Yeah, for sure. And the saying from my good friend, and I know your, your good friend as well, Tyler Zombro, he goes, yeah, train to throw a hundred, but don't throw it. Just throw your off speed. Exactly. <laughs> Cause if you're throwing a hundred, then your off speed is probably pretty nasty. So, um, but yeah, velocity does make everything better and it just increases the margin of error. You don't have to hit your spots. You can just stay in the zone. And as we just saw, 95 plus down the middle still gets out. So um, yeah, velocity still is king. Yep, exactly. So let's um, let's dive into some specifics of what a tr training program could look like an eight-week block. I'm going to share this PDF here. So these are essentially three different options and possibilities of what a schedule could look like. So the first one is the most conservative velocity program that you could follow. So for those of you that aren't watching or just listening, this is simply just showing what the progression would look like from a low day, also known as a recovery day, a medium day, also a hybrid day. Um, if you're familiar with drivelines terms, and then a high day would be that velocity day. So week one would have just one high day, one velocity day. So Monday, and Friday would be a hybrid or medium day. Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday are really light days. And then that Wednesday would be your velocity day. The following week, you would shift to two high days a week. So you would have a high day on Monday and Friday, low days, Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, and one medium slash hybrid day on Wednesday. And you would just go back and forth between these two weeks for the duration of your program. And the benefit of this one is it maximizes time for recovery. So you can see there's three light days in here. You only have one high day every other week. Um, so it just allows for more ample time to recover. So some of that volume can be higher and you can really get after it on those high days. The next one is a little bit more of a progression. So you're doing two high days every week, but they are on Mondays and Fridays and you still have three low days per week. So Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday are low days and you have one medium slash hybrid day on Wednesdays. And then the third option that I have here is more of the traditional plan. This is probably similar to what you did, Josh, I would guess, is you have two medium days, two low days, and two high days every week. So that could look like a medium day on Monday, high day on Tuesday, low day Wednesday, medium Thursday, high Friday, low Saturday. So this one is good, and I do use this, uh, but I will say you do need a deload typically after you know four or five weeks usually, and that's where maybe you deload to just one of these high days per week. Um, it depends on this the situation and how the velocity is trending. That can help you as well with whether you need a deload or not. But I'd be curious, Josh, which of these schedules have you used the most? And you know, what are your thoughts on all three of these? Yeah, so when I was just getting started, I used the second one where I go high on Mondays and then high on Fridays again. Um, and I'd have a medium day on Wednesday. And so on Monday, we would have the plyo velos. And then Wednesday, it was just a long toss day. Friday was the ply, uh, pull down day. But what I found was that as my velocity started to climb and I started to throw harder and harder, I could only take one high day per week. So um, instead of the two high days, I would do medium day Monday, medium day Wednesday, high day Friday. And that's kind of what worked for me when I did two high days, I just couldn't recover and it would um, make my whole body sore and I'll make backward progress. So I think really you just got to listen to your body and see what you can handle and just keep in mind as you're starting to throw harder and harder and getting into those 90s, it is more stressful on your body and you might need some more time to recover. Yeah, exactly. That's that's a great point of knowing yourself, knowing your body and not pushing through something just because you're supposed to have a high day that day. Understanding your body is super important. Another super, super important thing, not just for velo phases, really any phase, but you got to treat your low days like low days. You can't try to throw too hard on those days because it's going to mess up the rest of your week. So when it's a low day and you're supposed to throw at 50% effort for 20 throws or whatever it is, do it. Even if you feel better than you you expect to feel on a low day, treat it light because you're going to feel even better and fresh for the days where it actually matters to throw hard, which is your high days. Yeah, for sure. And one thing that I do is that I only throw plyos on these low days because 
I know that when I grip a baseball and start playing catch and I'm starting to mess with my pitches and everything, I'm just going to throw too many. And my low day turns into a medium day real quick. So I just grab my green ball, the one pound ball, and also the blue ball. And I just go through some drills, low effort, you know, sub 50% just to get some blood flow going, do the arm care, and then I'm done for the day. I love that. I think more people should do just plyos on the low days because you're not going to throw off speed pitches, right? You're not going to start ripping off speed pitches with a plyo ball. And since you're just throwing it into a wall, you're more than likely going to stop at the appropriate time because you have a set number of throws that you're probably making versus catch play. You have your partner. He's throwing pitches back at you. Maybe he's throwing sliders and you're like, oh, maybe I'll throw a couple sliders just to see how it feels today. And then, like you said, it turns into a medium day. And I would say the majority of pitchers live in that medium territory. They're in that 80% territory all the time. And truth be told, like I like medium days because I think they are good to like feel stuff, work on mechanical type things. But in my opinion, the real gains are made on the low days and they're made on the high days because you need the low days for the recovery and you need the high days to get the stimulus of throwing hard. Yeah. And I'd be curious to see what do you think about balancing the throwing volume and the lifting volume because when i was at driveline there was a whole program where when the lifting volume was really high and we were focusing on strength power and gaining weight and muscle the throwing program the volume decreased a lot and vice versa when we were starting to uh decrease the volume in the weight room we were starting to do more speed stuff lighter stuff the throwing volume really increased so i'm curious as to see what you think about that yeah, I generally agree with that. Like that's the what you typically see is you try to match those with each other or you know early in the off season when you're maybe not doing a lot of throwing volume, that's when there's going to be a lot of strength focus in the weight room. Now, I'm glad you brought up lifting though because most guys that are listening to this if you're a high schooler or a college guy who needs to throw harder, the weight room is probably a really important piece for you. So like let's just say you're doing one of these schedules this summer, like you can't be lifting light. Like you lifting needs to be a big part of your program most likely. And what's going to be important is that you try to match them with those high days. So like what I would do, let's just say you're lifting three days a week and you are following, let's just say the, the second one. So high days on Mondays and Fridays, I would have your lifting days be on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays as well. So that you're really timing up those low days to really be low days, because if it's a low throwing day, but then I get in the weight room and I'm pushing weight as hard as I can. It's no longer a low day from a physical standpoint. Maybe throwing it is, but I'm still really amplifying the intensity. My CNS is going through the roof. Like there's going to be other aspects to where you're, you're stressing the body and fatiguing yourself. So I would really try to match up the high days with your lifting as well. So lift after you throw on that Monday, after you throw on Wednesday, that Wednesday one would probably be more on the lighter end. So you have enough time to recover for that Friday lift. But like Mondays and Fridays, I would just make those like really big, full, high intensity days from a throwing and your lifting standpoint. Yeah, I agree 100%. And that's a mistake that I had made when I was first training was that I was like, all right, I'm going max effort throwing on Monday. And so I'm tired. So I'm just going to do my lower body lift on Tuesday. And then I'll go throw and then just alternate, alternate. And that really doesn't work because you're never recovering. And um, I know it sucks after pull down day, you're tired, you're gassed. But if you can try to get that lift in, then you're going to be able to recover and get those gains even better. So exactly so walk me through a little bit about like let's just say like a plyo velo day and maybe this has changed for you but like how do you like to balance the overload versus the underload balls are you going you know same amount of reps for each of them like let's just say you're going two blue two red two yellow two gray or you know did you find out over time that you were worse with one of the balls versus the other and you spent more time on that ball yeah exactly when i first started out i just did every ball um i did the green ball i did green blue red yellow and gray and i didn't do any more than the other but as i kept training and kept training i found that i was way better at throwing the heavier balls than the lighter balls and so i would focus more on the lighter balls and i know there's a lot of things about arm strength versus arm speed i'm not too um sure about that but 
I think just attacking your weaknesses is really huge. And but at the start, you want to really um, just hammer the fundamentals and throw them all. Yeah, you said it perfectly. Yeah, early on, use all of them. And over time, you're going to start to see like, what is the weakness for you? Like for me, it's heavy balls. And what's funny is actually lefties. What I found is lefties are usually better at underloads and righties are better at overloads. So that's something for you to think about. Now it's not everybody, but that's on average. So definitely over time, try to go more into what your strengths are and, or sorry, try to lean more into what your weaknesses are so you can get better at that. And that will hopefully help bring up your floor and your velocity as well. Yeah, for sure. I mean, when I was doing the driveline program, I would throw the blue ball like as hard as some of the hardest throws there were in there. But then my gray ball, I would only be able to throw in the mid 80s. And I would be thinking, why would that happen? And it was just because I wasn't throwing, I wasn't moving quick enough. And so by focusing on those lighter balls, I was able to attack my weaknesses. And that's ultimately what led to my next spike in velocity. Yeah, no, I love that. That's great. Did you have any players or do you currently have any players that you try to model yourself after from a delivery standpoint? Or like, is there any guys you, you watch that throw really hard that you try to copy some of the things that they do? Yeah, I actually think this is uh, this might be an unlock for some players is that just look at your favorite MLB pitcher and try to copy them. And so when I was young, I would always look up to you, Darvish. And he has a little bit more of an unorthodox delivery because um, he's Japanese and they kind of go through things a little bit differently over there. But if you can really try to model your mechanics after an MLB pitcher and it actually looks like it, then chances are you're going to be in a good spot and it's going to be a pretty good delivery without really focusing on you know, the tiny details of, oh, I want to feel my back leg, I want to feel my lead leg. It's more just like, all right, I'm trying to copy him and throw the ball as hard as I can. I like that. And I think I've, I've seen people talk about this before, but players that are sons of former big leaguers usually have really good looking swings or good mechanics because they grew up around the field. They watched the best of the best do it as little kids and they were able to emulate them, right? Like, probably one of the best, actually the best, I would say that was the son of a former big leaguer was Ken Griffey Jr. He grew up around his dad being in the big leagues all the time and he got to see it firsthand. And I'm sure that played a huge role in his development of being able to see the greats and just mimic them and copy them and, and get to see it day in and day out. Yeah, for sure. And with the Texas Rangers, we have Jack Leiter and he throws gas. And obviously his dad was a great big leaguer and I'm sure that had a lot to do with it for sure. Yeah. So just a couple of things before we wrap this up, you know, the summer is approaching fairly soon for guys and there's gonna be a lot of players that are deciding whether to play summer ball or whether to just train. So I'm thinking more specifically about college age guys, because I do know a lot of colleges will send their players to play summer ball. What do you think should be the deciding factor for a college age kid, whether he should play summer ball or should train? Uh, again, I think it depends on your goals, but if your goal is to get drafted this year, then you really got to assess your situation and compare yourself to the guys who are actually getting drafted and be like, am I good enough? And it's really hard to look at yourself from an objective standpoint, but as a general rule, if you aren't th topping out at at least 93 miles an hour or you have terrible command or you don't have a good off-speed pitch, then it might be a good decision to go train at one of these facilities and um, attack your weakness. And so you come back for the main season and if you dominate, then you're going to have a chance to get drafted. But I think on the other hand, if you have all the stuff, you have the velo, the command and the off speed, and now all you need is the exposure. Then if you can get into a really good summer ball league, then that's definitely worth it. Could agree more. You said it perfectly. Well, I think that wraps it up for this episode. A lot of really good nuggets for guys. And, um, you know, at the end of the day, you have to know where you're at in your career and what you really want.